Hello everybody and welcome to this special edition of the First Take UK podcast. We are previewing the National Football League and there's no one I like to talk about the NFL more, pro football, than my good friend and co-host Mr. Stephen Edwards. Stephen, how's it going? Yeah, it's going really well. It's, NFL season is almost here. I, I don't buy into his preseason stuff. It's um, all a bit tiresome at times. I'm ready for the actual uh, gridiron to get started properly in, what's it, just under two weeks' time now? Is it two weeks tonight, isn't it? The two, Thursday night yeah, game? Two weeks tonight, and we've got college football or literally a week away. We're a mm. week from college football, so that's exciting. Tonight's exclusively pro football, and we're going to preview the AFC. A conference, Stephen, that was pretty dire across the board last year. There was clearly one standout team, and not much has changed, really. Yeah, I mean, the, the Broncos were a standout team, and it seems they picked up every player they could and, and somehow stayed under a cap. <laughs> I don't think there's a cap when it comes to the Broncos <laughs> and John Elway. He's never had any rules. He plays by his own rules, and he's playing by his own salary cap rules. Yeah, I, I don't quite know how they manage that when I, I sit here and look at my team and they can't put two players on a field of any real ability. But I, they somehow managed to do it. And then, of course, they then got blown out in the Super Bowls. So it says a lot about the the AFC last year. But I, for me, I, I think it's slightly different this year. But um, I think we've got the same teams that are going to be involved uh, in in the playoff reckoning. But We'll get the AFC out of the way first because I think the more interesting discussions revolve around the NFC when we do that particular show. Still some terrific storylines and let's start with the AFC North and a city that John Elway once kicked the boot to in Baltimore. I remember that when they were the Colts and not the Ravens. The Baltimore Ravens went 8-8 eight and eight last year. Have they improved above 500 going into this year? Yeah, I, I think they have. I mean, it, it's very difficult to even think about his team being the fact that, what is it? It's, it's under two years since the, yeah, um, years. the Super Bowl. And I, I really think that they can actually go above 500 this season. I think their offensive line for me is is improved. I think they've got excellent depth across the board. Um, and I think when you take a look at their season last year, I mean, they I think it was a four losses. There were less than a field goal. So you, mm-hmm. You, you kind of look at the fact that any of those games could have gone either way, and I think that they're, they're probably the team that's primed most, I think, for a, a bounce-back season in this particular very competitive AFC North. So I, I would certainly um, look for them to get above 500. Yeah, this division is loaded, and sort of the storyline going into last year was that the defense is going to be all over the place because there's no Ray Lewis, because all the senior guys have gone. And actually, the defense wasn't too bad. They ranked 12th in the league, and it's always with these offensive struggles. I spoke to you about this time and time again. Mm-hmm. They have this really weird scheme fit where they're asking Joe Flacco to ping these little passes all over the place. They're trying to run the football, and then they've got a real vertical threat in Torrey Smith, and they got a guy with one of the best arms in the entire league in Joe Flacco, and it was just an odd fit. And it sort of still looks like an odd fit now that Gary Kubiak's there. But at least if they're going to go to a shorter passing game and not stretch the field too much, they've brought in guys who are used to that and can do that effectively. Steve Smith, Owen Daniels. They've got a ton of tight ends on the roster. Dennis Pitter. They've got like four guys on the roster, which means three, four tight end sets could be coming our way. I think we're going to see them go back to some power football because they ran the ball so ineffectively last year. Yeah. Ray Rice, 3.1 yards a carry. I really like the pick with Justin Forsett. they got some decent backs there, Bernard Pierce as well. So maybe it's a blessing in disguise that Ray Rice is banned so they can see what could happen if they leave Ray out of there. And I think that could be the make of the offense. Yeah, I think so as well. I mean, I, I do think that the, the offense will look very, very different. I mean, their, their running game, as you say, last season was, was pretty anemic. I mean... That they was running like a Dolphins team of old. They, they could barely get above three three carries at three yards a carry at times. I mean, you're not going to win football by running like that. You've you've got to be able to have a solid running game in this modern day age of football to lay to open up the passing lanes. I I, I think you know you've got Joe Flacco there, and and Joe Flacco is a guy that when you know when the big games come around, he can win those big games. I mean. It's going to be very interesting to see how this team uh, particularly bounces back from last season. And maybe they're one of those teams that, you know, kind of needed the wake up call last year that, you know, things didn't quite go as planned. But they're going to go back onto the uh, the Ravens team that we know they can be of two years ago. And I'm not ready to put them back in a in a Super Bowl game yet, but I, I do think they're going to be much improved this season. Does the mixture of Gary Kubiak, a notorious guy who likes to use a, a bootleg, a play action, a guy who likes to have his quarterback move around, even if he's not the most mobile guy like a Matt Schaub, at least get him moving so he's not a sitting target. When you marry that up with Joe Flacco, who's a notorious sitting target, I think he knows he has legs. 
Mm. I'm kind of convinced when I watch him, he's all just upper body. He doesn't know he has legs. Um, does that kind of worry you for this offensive fit? It seems like a really bizarre way to go if you're the general manager. Yeah, I mean, it seems almost like a like a clash there somewhat. I, I suppose it, what they could potentially try and do is just create a bit of unpredictability around Flacco and just maybe try and get him, get him moving a little bit. But um, if he's going to be that sitting duck that, that he has been, then I think this could be a um, one of the more troublesome areas on the field for the Ravens. But we know what, as I say, we know what Flacco can do. But you've just got to make sure that you can um, get the most out of him and you know maybe Gary Kubiak might not necessarily be the guy to do that. I think the key thing to win with on the Ravens is you look at them 8-8 eight eight last year, 500. They did nothing but improve in what they did in the offseason. They bring in CJ Mosley, one of my favorite players in the draft, yeah. stole Timmy Jernigan in the draft, picked up a couple of defensive backs in the draft, and then brought in four sets, Steve Smith and Owen Daniels as offensive weapons, and lost basically nothing. So they're a 500 yeah. team that improved in multiple areas. Yeah, as I say, so I, I love their depth. Mm -hmm. I, I really do. I mean, they've just added, added so many little pieces around, and and I just think, you know, if you take a look at last year's team and you look at a team that was very, you know, kind of unlucky in a way, if you lose those many close games and, you know, you can always look at the other fact that you've got to, you know, you've got to be a better team to actually be able to win those close games. But I think, you know, they'll, they'll convert, so they could so easily convert some of those losses into wins. And, and this is why I've kind of got them going up a, a couple of wins on last season. And in this particular uh, conference that they make a couple of wins they're going to vault them back into the playoffs let's move to Pittsburgh then their, their rivals and you look at how they performed last year an 8-8 eight eight team again one of these big names who wasn't able to go above 500 and yet the story again with them was defense is too old you got to let Polamalu go. you got to let Timmons go. Everyone's got to go. Let's blow up the defense. Maybe even Dick LeBeau shouldn't come back. Then you go and check back at the stats and you watch the games. They were pretty damn good. They were 13th in overall defense with a team that should never have even been that close in defense. And when you have two of the four or five best defensive minds on planet Earth in Dick LeBeau and Mike Tomlin, the defense is going to be loaded. And now let's just hand the thing over to Big Ben and hope he can take us to 9-10 wins. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, we had our concerns about Pittsburgh going into last season at times, and uh, and I, th I think it was the um, you know, we saw them over here last season against the Vikings, and you know they showed some signs that day, but you know, they didn't ultimately win that particular game. But I mean, they they weren't that bad. I mean, it's one of those things that sometimes the record doesn't quite reflect exactly what you actually do perform on the field. I mean, I think their their offense will be better this season. I also like the fact around their defense because they've got the they've got the veteran core there as well. But I think you've got some young, hungry talent on that defense that could step up this season. And again, now another team along with the Ravens for me that will you know add a couple of wins in I think this very very competitive AFC North. I mean, it may be a case of they try and knock each other off, but I, I really quite like this Pittsburgh team this year as as maybe a team that could potentially win this division. Yeah, and the two. The two young guys that stand out in the way they've improved that defense, you're looking at Ryan Sh Shazier, and I'll say that right, I'll get it right eventually, <laughs> Ryan Shazier out of Ohio State, who they're kicking inside to inside linebacker, which scares the heck out of me. I don't know if you remember pre-draft, I was saying, this is the young fella who, as Skip Bayless would say, unleash! <laughs> the guy has got no football brain, and I don't mean that offensively. He's never been asked to have a football brain. Urban Meyer just literally said, you stand on the edge, when that ball snaps, you go wreak havoc in the backfield. And he's so athletic and so physically gifted, he's always done it. Now you stick him in a complicated system like Dick LeBeau's, where you're using him sometimes inside in the middle linebacker spot. It's a weird thing to do. So they're showing real faith in some of these young guys to really take this team this year. And then also they picked up Steven Tuitt, who somehow fell out the first round because the idiot coach at Notre Dame said stick on a load of weight, which made no sense to me. But he seems to have dropped the weight. So he's going to be like a first round talent. He can play right now. They've got great defensive coaches, great rotation. But the Shazier thing slightly worries me. I thought he'd been a great acquisition. Just get this young fella coming off the edge and the old veterans drop back into coverage, play their game. And now they're trying to move him inside. It scares me a bit. Yeah, I mean, I always worry about time when you do things like that with a player because, I mean, they've been so used to playing um, one particular way and you're trying to um, adapt them to play a, a slightly different way. I mean, you just don't know how that's going to turn out. But I think it's the same. I mean, you, you've got those veterans on that on the defense and you've got guys like uh, Shazer and, uh, and that, that are coming into this team and they're, they're only going to learn from some of these players that have you know, been there seen there done it all and uh, 
let's not forget as well, you've got a, um, a certain Hall of Fame offensive line coach there as well this year. No doubt about it. Um, they've just so, th this is another team that's just so clever at acquiring good coaches. Mm. It's like maybe the guy failed as a head coach, but let's go and get him as an offensive line coach. And he'll be the best in the business as the offensive line coach. N not enough organizations do that, in my opinion. They cast in away, they run off to ESPN and stuff, and you've got to keep them within an organization. Offensively, I'm still worried about the Steelers. I really am. Not just the fact they don't have playmakers, but more schematically with what they're trying to do. I would just let Big Ben run that offense. I yeah. say this about quarterbacks all the time. The guys have been in the league long enough. They audible often enough. At least Ben's allowed to now. Let them call the plays. Go no huddle. Or huddle quickly if you want to. Let him call plays. And if you see something you really don't like from upstairs, coordinate to go upstairs. If you see something, mic it into him. Yeah, I mean, the other thing I worry about with Ben is that the fact that the amount of hits this guy takes. I mean, the, the, I mean, the guy, to be perfectly honest with you, it's as good job at times he is as huge as he is. <laughs> because kidding. that's pretty much saved him from some really, really bad injuries. And I, you just begin to wonder at some point that someone's going to really hit him. Mm -hmm. um, and he could really have some problems. But I, I, I trust Ben as, as, you know, alongside a hell of a lot of other quarterbacks around this league because... He's been there, seen there, done it all, Mr. Reliable. Um, you know, we we almost looked at last season, you know, almost like a marriage breakup. You know, was, was Ben actually going to leave the Steelers? Mm. And now we're looking at going into another season here where Ben's still at the helm. And, uh, you know, this could very well be a, a season that um, things could go rather well for the Steelers. But it is a, it's an interesting division and certainly probably my favourite division in the AFC. And do they need to sort out the the fact that their rookies are selling pot to their running backs? <laughs> it's an issue, right? Just ever so slightly. <laughs> so slightly. <laughs> the understatement of the year candidate right there when we do our award ceremony at the end of the year. <laughs> Come on, Le'Veon Bell. These, like Eric Blunt's like a 26-year-old man. Why is he taking pot from a guy out of K-State? <laughs> Jesus, the guy's got serious issues. That's why if I had him in my office as Mike Tonnet, I'd be like, man, 26 years old. <laughs> What's going on here? I'm not even bothered about the weed, but come on, sort yourself out. Um, let's move to Cincinnati. They've been the cream of this division for uh, you know a few years now. They've been to the playoffs three times. We all know the story. I genuinely see it. Not a major step back because they've still got all the talent in the world, but do you trust any coach on their coaching staff? Marvin Lewis, i got major question marks. I don't trust Hugh Jackson at all, and I don't know enough about Paul Gunther to go in with trust when they just lost a great defensive coordinator. Do you know, I, I started to worry there for a minute when you said, let's move to Cincinnati. <laughs> <laughs> it's an announcement. <laughs> I was like, really? Yeah, first take Cincy. Just, I like it. Just have to uh, tell the wife <laughs> moving to Cincinnati. <laughs> Yeah, you know, Ollie's decided to up sticks and move the offices to Cincinnati. How do you feel about that? Um, I, I think the thing, I mean, you've got the f familiarity on offense. I mean, we talked about this offense last season and how loaded this particular offense could be. Mm -hmm. We always look at Andy Dalton. I think he does, you know, he does enough during the regular season, but I wouldn't trust him in a playoff game as far as I could throw him. Um, I don't like the same as you. I don't like their coaching setup. I mean, is it about time that we start? really doing a major clearing house with this because if you've got a quarterback with this much talent around him you've got to sometimes start asking questions as to why this team isn't quite going that next level and I think you then start to look at the coaching staff for me and, and I think that's where you definitely should uh, start making some of those changes but I think they're going to be one of those teams that are going to be uh, they're going to score a fair amount of points but I, I don't know. I, I think they're, they're one of those teams that could like blow out a team one week and then lose a close game the next. I don't know if Dalton's got the uh, mental game to win those close games. And I think that could be one of their biggest downfalls as the season goes on. Because I think with the Pittsburgh, what looks like their potential on the rise, Baltimore on the rise as well. Maybe it's the Bengals that maybe take that bit of a step back and, and fall out of contention for that divisional title this year. And I don't trust Hugh Jackson, but the one thing he will do is simplify the offense more than Jay Gruden. Jay Gruden is a big elaborate thinker, and that's mm -hmm. where when you know you see him move on to, to Washington, you get excited what he can do with Robert Griffin. He probably had to box himself in for Andy Dalton, and Hugh Jackson's a guy who lives in the box, so maybe that's going to be a decent match and will help Andy a little bit more. And you look at how they played last year, 10th in offense, 3rd in defense, and they've returned everyone 
everyone on both sides of the ball except for Michael Johnson. And they got the guy Marcus Hunt, who they drafted in the first round last year, so he should be good to go as a replacement now. So basically, everyone's coming back. And I wrote in my notes here, this is a great team <laughs> in depth, yeah. in quality. My only two questions are quarterback and head coach. I mean, it, has there been a situation in the recent NFL where a team's been so loaded and the mm. two major anomalies are in the two most important things in the team? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, we looked at this team last season. I think both of us um, put this team quite high up. I mean, I was sat down stupidly, put this team in the Super Bowl last season. But because you looked at the talent. <laughs> I... You looked at the talent they had, and you was like, well, why on earth is this team not in the Super Bowl? And that's why I think you start looking. If it's if you've got these the, the offense and the defense is very good as well, and, and this team is not going to that next level, and there's got to be something fundamentally wrong. I mean, do you trust Andy Dalton to win a close game mentally? Uh, mentally, no. Yeah. <laughs> this is what Andy has to do: is he has to come out there and say, "I ain't keeping this game close." Well, I don't trust myself. Let's go out there and light this thing up early on, and if it blows up, it blows up. They've been really conservative in playoff games, and I rewatched last year's one earlier today. They've been conservative, and he's blown up. Whereas they do come out at times, they did do in in the regular season, and just throw it all over the place. Yeah. Gun it, gun it, gun it. We got AJ Green. They tried to box him up again because they don't trust him in the playoffs and that was when he was at his worst because then all the pressure's on him he's like wow i've got to do this and this and this i would genuinely just say go out there and have fun try and win the game throw it all over the shop and if it doesn't work i mean it's no worse than the last three times we tried it you know last three times we tried to box you up and make you the the thing that would not prevent us from going in and put it on everyone else's shoulder and you've been i mean one of the worst playoff performers we've ever seen statistically and just watching him he crumbles it like it looks in pain playing the, in the playoffs yeah and this is the reason why i think they're going to win games where that uh, some weeks i'll just blow a team out mm -hmm. they would just over match a team and then the next week they'll get brought into this close game and then that's the game they can't win he, the prime example i think in this division is you put them say against like a, a, the ravens mm -hmm. the ravens will keep that game close and then to say i'll find a way to lose that game mm -hmm. No, you're you smart, and I genuinely agree. Um, where do you rank AJ Green in wide receivers in the league? 1,400 yards last year, 11 touchdowns. He may be, and it's hard to say because you've got Calvin Johnson in the league, so it just throws everything out of proportion. Let's yeah. just put Calvin on like Mount Rushmore on his own island, and let's start. <laughs> let's stop ranking wide receivers in his league. Let's just put him somewhere else. Outside of Calvin, he may be the best, especially one on one. Yeah, he's a, he's a very talented wide receiver. I think that's the main issue. You just highlighted there is the fact that other people get uh compared to uh, Calvin and that's just not fair that's just a <laughs> that's a once in a generation wide receiver and one of the greatest no one's ever had that build has anyone been built like that and run that fast <laughs> no it's unfair <laughs> it'll never happen again it's impossible it genuinely is um I, I, I like the Bengals. It's because I love that team so much because everyone's so talented and every year they draft. I'm like, wow, they got the guy I wanted to, someone to take in the draft. And then they go to Marvin Lewis and he's just not a good enough head coach. No, but, and this is it. I think, do you know, the funny thing is, I think with Cincinnati, is they'll win enough mm -hmm. for him to keep his job. Well, he's not good anywhere anyway. They're not paying no. anyone. <laughs> They're not going to pay anyone. Don't be so silly. Um, Let's move to Cleveland. Next stop on the bus tour, <laughs> we're moving to Cleveland. <laughs> Back up, people, we're moving to Cleveland. Uh, we had the announcement, was it yesterday, early today? I can't even remember. Um, Hoyer over yeah. Moni Yanzel. We're taking the Thomas More approach. We ain't saying his name anymore. It's Moni Yanzel until he becomes newsworthy. Um, right decision, wrong decision? I, I think we we talked about this, didn't we? And we, we both agreed that this would be the right decision to start the season. I mean... Johnny Manziel, as much as he'll sell God knows what merchandising, he'll give the bring the excitement back to the NFL if you just started him day one. But I think I think sometimes you've got to play with the the right deck of cards and Hoyer's got to be the guy to start the season. That's not to say that we won't see Manziel at some point in the season, because I think we will do. I mean, we saw a merry go round the quarterbacks in Cleveland last year. I mean, this team has got so many question marks, I think. You know, if you get to a point of where the season's a write off, then maybe that's when you do then look at Manziel, but you don't throw him to the wolves on week one. Um I mean, this team is is poor for me. I think they're they're one of these teams that needs to spend a good few years in the draft to try and upgrade relevant parts of their team to even become a, a team in a few years that can 
actually compete in this division. I think this team could get railroaded at times. Well, I love that defense, and it was ninth last year. This is a defense that's going to look great whenever you watch them, but they're going to get so tired because they're always yep. on the field. And statistically, they'll probably drop from ninth to like seventeenth or something. Everyone be like, "Whoa, we're going to start drafting for the defense to go and help mm -hmm. that defense." But they'll be absolutely fine in it when they get to split the share of the, the you know the game load fifty fifty. I love the young talent. I didn't like the Justin Gilbert pick in the draft when he moved down because I wanted to take Sammy Watkins with the Josh Gordon suspension. But I think they've drafted pretty well. They got one of the best corners in football in Joe Hayden. The defense is sound. Then let's look at the offense. Um, yeah, it's pretty nasty. I don't yeah. trust the offensive coordinator Kyle Shanahan. I don't trust him as far as I can throw him. What was the one thing that I sat here? Straight after they drafted Johnny, I said, install one offense. Bring in one yeah. offense, get them both to play it. They've had two offenses, and I don't trust Mike Pettin because he comes from that Rex Ryan school of defense, defense, defense. The defense looks great. And when I watched them in that second preseason game, the way they split the snaps was the most bizarre I've ever seen it done before. Not here's two series, then we take you off, here's two series. It was like on a just on a whim. Johnny, you go out now. Oh, let's take Johnny back out. Brian, you go out, we'll take you out. None of them can build a rhythm or have like a preset game plan for four or five plays. This is what we're running. I, I don't know what this organization's doing. I really don't. No, I mean, this, this organization is in, unfortunately, in disarray. Um, as much as you've got the, um, you know, the, the excitement around Johnny Manziel coming over, it's just the fact that everything else surrounding this particular team is 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 pretty poor, unfortunately. And as I say, and it, it's, I've got nothing against the defense. It's just the fact that, as, as you say, and I agree with you, it's the fact that the defense is going to spend a hell of a lot of time on that football field. It's just going to get ground into the, you know, run into the ground because it's just not going to be able to get off the field long enough before they're getting shot back out again. As the offense goes another three and out, and here they, you know, they just, it's just going to get tiresome over a period of time. And I think it's just going to get to a point of where you'll get maybe you know halfway through the season, and if Cleveland's season's a right up, which I think it will be. Um, that you'll end up seeing Manziel out there and just try and generate some excitement and give him. You know, a few shots and see exactly what he can actually do in this league. Um, because I don't think Hoy is your, your long term solution anyway. So it, for me, it was very much a safe option. And I think it's, it still is the right option. Definitely the right option. There's a great um, a list going around, and I tweeted this out earlier about 21, years, 21 year old who stars in the NFL. That's where Johnny's at now. People keep forgetting this when they look at the young antics and stuff. The guy should be a junior in college now. Mm. <laughs> he left as a redshirt sophomore. He's crazy young to be playing in the NFL. I want him to come out of high school and you know, be redshirted and stuff, but he's still really young for that environment. He's just nowhere near ready. He's not even close to being ready. He should sit for the whole year, but it'll be in week four after the bye week when Hoya gets hurt. Um, should we do predictions of the standings and stuff? Yeah, let's do let's do predictions. So I've gone and given some of my commentary first. So where do you see the AFC North? Well, I got the Browns. I think it's going to be pretty damn bad. I just look at the <laughs> offense. you got Ben Tate. You got Miles Austin, who's always concussed. You got Nate Burleson, who's never healthy, and you got Jordan Cameron. God love, and he's gonna have to. He came out of nowhere last year. Now he's like the primary option as tight end on a really yep. bad Cleveland Browns team. And then he's gonna be looking around and be going, "Why is my five foot eleven quarterback running all over the place in week seven? Because that's what Johnny Football does. So it's gonna be rough for them. He really is. I think it's gonna be five and eleven, and there's gonna be times, unfortunately, where that great defense is gonna look bad, and they'll probably quit on the game. It's just one of those situations. They've got the Ravens at eight and eight. I know they've improved slightly. It's more of just a a, a thing on who they're going to play the schedule that I was looking at earlier. It looks pretty rough at different points. I just can't see them. I just don't have enough faith in them in that offense at Gary Kubiak until I see it to put them above that eight and eight mark. Bengals at nine and seven. Big drop off for me from them. We discussed that. And I got the Steelers at ten and six. I just trust them to win. That's the, this division to me comes down to trust because they're all talented, and I just trust the Steelers more. Yeah, I mean, I it, it's a very, very tough division to call outside of Cleveland. I mean, I think we we all sit here and agree that Cleveland are going to finish last. I've got, I've got Cleveland at four and twelve. Mm -hmm. um, I've got Baltimore at nine and seven. I think I've got a little bit more trust in you. We talked about it early one. I think they are going to go above um, five hundred. And then I've got Cincinnati at ten and six. Mm -hmm. And I then got the Steelers also at ten and six. Oh, nice. So I think I think it's going to be a very, very competitive... I think it is the most competitive division in football, and I, I think that's the way it's going to go. Um, and then um, the, the the top three teams in this are going to make the playoffs. Baltimore make the playoffs at 9 and 7. 
they're all going to keep kick a ton of lumps out of each other. They'll all oh, be they'll all be done by the playoffs. They'll all be burnt out. It'd be incredible. Um, let's go down south, and this is a place I would move to. I would move to Jacksonville, Florida. <laughs> I would definitely move to Jacksonville, Florida. And as I move there, they'll move to London. I'll be happy, happy as Larry when I have to watch them play football. Um, they've improved a fair bit. They were everyone was like raving about them at times last year. How much, how much growth they've shown. They won a game in football. Congrats to them. <laughs> they went thirty first in defense and thirty second in offense. It's about as bad as it can get. It really is. Um, but they have improved with some of their additions. I love what they did in the draft in terms of the receiver position. I love that they yeah. went and got Toby Gerhardt. You know, I rave about him as the backup from Minnesota. Upgraded the offensive line, which will help the young rookie when he eventually plays. Got Blaine Gabba out the building. Got Maurice Jones throughout the building. All in all, very good offseason in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they, they had a, a very good draft. I mean, if you like to say that, they've got, they got a talented crop of uh, rookie wide receivers that, you know, that they probably haven't had the weapons there in some time. And, you know, you, you add that into what they've what they already have, so I think that's really going to help. I think I think the optimism is there because I think they finished four and four in the last eight games in 2013, and it's all of a sudden given um, a few London Jaguars fans a little bit of hope that this team might actually be a little bit competitive this season. You but, should want them uh, to stop winning, London Jaguars fans. That'll make the commissioner move them quicker. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, they are moving in the right direction. Um, they say in general, they, they are going to do better than they have done. But I mean, we've got the quarterback uh, situation with uh, you know, Chad Henney and, I don't, and, and, and Bortles. I think we ultimately want to see Bortles mm-hmm. be the quarterback, and I think we will do when um, Henney starts stinking up the joint. <laughs> Eventually, he will do. But the, the, I have a bit of a question mark above, uh, about Gerhard at, at the running back, to be honest, because I think... You, you, I think they were they were keen when they went out and got him. It was like one of their you know their, their guys they really really wanted um, mm-hmm. to come over um, to be their starting running back this year. But obviously it's a it's an unknown situation for them because he's not been a guy that's had to be the feature back over the course of a season. So it'd be very interesting to see how he actually adjusts to be able to do that. But you know, there is some optimism there for Jacksonville. They are moving in the right direction, but let's not get carried away. Yeah, I, I like Gerhardt. I think he's gonna have to be only gonna have to be like a four yard runner. Genuinely, they run they're gonna run this power run scheme with Jed Fish. Let's just get eight yards on first two downs and then try and be you know efficient on third down and try and win some ball games. I love their defense because I love their defensive coordinator. People have to go on YouTube. This guy speak and just talk about football. <laughs> he's epic. He's called Bob Babich, and he was doing this interview the other day to the press corps, and it was hilarious. They were asking him about his scheme, how he wants to run <laughs> defensively, and he was literally like, "I want the ball." Like deadpan. I wish I had links to it and clips we could play now, but he's just like, I want the ball. I want to go get the ball. I'm making the prediction now. They'll have the most penalties in the entire NFL, and it'll be double whoever's second. I think it's going to be unbelievable to watch him. you got Gus Bradley from you know the Pete Carroll school up in Seattle, trying to bring that down south. you got Bob Babich, who doesn't care about first downs, you know, big yardage. He just wants to punch and attack the football and get it back to their offense. This team's going to be fun to watch defensively. Yeah, I think this team is going to be fun to watch, which is just as well because you can get past them god awful uniforms that they wear. Because I'm, I'm not a fan of of those, but uh, they, they're going to come over to London again. They're going to come over. They're going to lose. They're going to go home. We're going to hear a lot of talk around the Jaguars <laughs> moving to London, and that's the reason why I, as much as I want to like the Jaguars as a team, it really does put me off of them. No doubt. I, um entirely concur with you you know i do you know my feelings on this <laughs> let's move to the most irrelevant team in football the tennessee titans is anyone more relevant than them it just needs to go back to houston <laughs> they need to see for a start kick the texans out of houston and put the titans that. back over there but bring back the oilers houston should move to san antonio to stop oakland from moving and the titans should move to houston and become the oilers Exactly. There we go. Job done. Job done. Um, this team is bizarre to me. That front office is bizarre to me. They hired Ken Wizenhunt, who I like. He yeah. seemed to revive Philip Rivers' career last year. It's going to be really good for Jake Locker. But Jake Locker can't stay healthy. He never did in Washington. It's not like he came to the NFL and it's like a big surprise the guy can't stay healthy. I don't think he's ever been healthy his entire life. I don't think he's ever played more than eight games in a season, and that includes college. It's, um, it's rough. And when you pass up on Manziel, Bridgewater, and Carr in favour of keeping Jake Locker. It's not even like... like It's not like if they brought them in, they'd have fo- been forced to play ahead of Jake Locker. It would have just been a security blanket saying, look, Jake, we can't trust you to stay healthy. It wouldn't have been a major issue in my eyes. I, that could haunt them for a long time. Bridgewater's could be pretty damn good. 
Yeah, I, I think this should have been the move where they really tried to bring in a guy that could be their future quarterback because obviously, as you say, Locker cannot stay healthy and that's going to be one of the main problems. It's, it's all very well being uh, Ken Woods and Hunt, but if he can't work with a quarterback that can stay healthy, then that's going to be one of the one of the major issues for a start. I mean, they've also got to re- got to replace as well Chris Johnson as well. I mean, that's a that's a loss for them. And this this team is is quite fortunate in a way because they're going to play one of the the softest schedules mm-hmm. in the NFL, apart from their uh, divisional games against the Indianapolis Colts. I mean, uh, that 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 kind of takes their um, opposing winning percentage from last year up. But if you'd have taken it, if they hadn't got the Colts in their division as well, this would just be an absolute steamroll of a schedule. And yet you still can't see them winning that many games. No, I really You still can't. pick them to lose the games against the teams that are not that great either. And I'm a big Zach Mettenberger fan, but he's only had one good year in college after he should have been Peter Manning coming out of high school and he just bombed and bombed until Cam Cameron got there. So I'm not convinced he's going to be able to do it, even with a good coach in Ken Wizard Hunt. And they lose one of the best cornerbacks in the game. A letter on Werner is a top five guy. Me and Josh Hunt discussed this the other day. He easily is. If you're the front office and you've got all this cap room because Chris Johnson's leaving, why aren't you pony up the money to keep him around? That makes no sense to me. No. It, well, it's, it's, again, isn't it? It's just a, a franchise that that continues to defy sense. And I think that's like the common theme, isn't it? You start talking about like Cleveland, you talk about Tennessee, that these are the franchises. The reason why they're down at the bottom year in, year out, is because they continue to make baffling decisions from a player personnel standpoint. And my final gripe with the Titans, and then yeah. we're going to move on from them because I'm annoyed at them for passing on those guys and doing everything they've done. And I like Ken Wizard and I hope he succeeds, but they bring in Ray Horton from Cleveland. They were ran a 4-3 last year pretty effectively. They were 14th ranked defense. And if they improved with some of the additions they brought in, like Al Woods and Wesley Woodyard, it would have got better. For some reason, they say, let's run a 3-4. We just signed personnel for a 4-3. We've run a 4-3 for the last few years. Now let's just, for no reason at all, move to a 3-4 with zero personnel who can play it. That's just, that's bizarre. That's Jerry Jones stuff. That's what Jerry Jones did. Look what yeah. happened to the Cowboys defense. It's bizarre. Yeah, I mean, you. this is this is it. It's the old thing, isn't it, that you buy, you bring in players to fit the system you have. Well, successful teams do. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Seems like your Dolphins got on a big spending spree a year ago or whatever it was and then say, hey, figure out the pieces, Joe Philbin, rookie head coach. Yeah, it's like, here we go, we're going to give you all the jigsaw pieces, we're going to throw them up in the air, but you find a way to put them together. Meanwhile, Bill Belichick's ringing up some like guy who walked on a pit because he plays nice in his 4-3 and says, come on, lad, and we go to the AFC Championship game. Yeah, I'll make you a pro bowler in a couple of years. <laughs> uh, let's go to Indianapolis then. This team may be the most overrated team in sports. And I love Andrew Luck more than probably anyone. I picked him to win MVP, I think, last year. I love him. The team is just bad. It, oh, there's just flower, no talent on the Colts outside for Andrew Luck. It's a bad team. I think the thing is, as well, is because Andrew Luck is, is just a guy that you know we all, we all love and, you know, he... He's come into a situation and he's, you know, he's got this got this team. He's in a very, very, very weak division. So therefore, the Colts record for me will always be inflated. Mm-hmm. And the minute you start inflating a record, then it then becomes a lot of hype. Um, I mean, I, 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 I like the offense. I, th- I think, you know, that he's got the weapons around him that, you know, will, will put up points. But I, I really don't see how this team will succeed going forward when they get into the playoffs. I just think they'll be one of those teams that will look the great in the regular season. They'll go like 6-0 against their division. They'll find ways to win games. They'll split the other like five, the other games 500, and then they'll get to the playoffs, and then they'll then lose in the first round of the playoffs because they can't beat a, a really good team on a consistent basis. And yet they're another team that look very, very good one minute on offense. Everything is clicking as it should be. And then another another game that things will just go wrong for them. They just won't be able to beat that team. So I, I'm not so sure whether I want to put them the most overrated team as as you've got them just yet. But I I do think they are to a point overrated, and I do think their record is inflated considering the actual um, class of player personnel they have. I still think they'll win they'll win the division, but as a team. Oh, yeah. It's the most overrated team. It just is. Outside of luck, they've got Hakeem next, which is a decent deal because it's like a one-year show me. Mm. But as Neil Dutton pointed out, it was a contract year from last year. That was a one-year show me. He showed us nothing. He didn't get a touchdown. Um, Reggie Wayne's 35 coming off an ACL. 
I like Dante Moncrief out of Ole Miss, but it's a rookie. You trust in a rookie to be the main threat for your offense? They've got seven lads, I think, out of Stanford that came with Andrew Luck, including the offensive coordinator. So they'll do things because he's so great. And I hate when people say he's over it. Oh, Andrew Luck's done nothing. He throws all these picks. Watch a game. Watch mm. it. He's running for his dear life. It's yeah. a turnstile. It is a turnstile. That's also a reason why Trent Richardson was so bad. I know he's the butt of a load of jokes, but I'm telling you, go back and watch two games this week on Game Pass and just watch what that offensive line's like. It's unbelievable how bad they are. So it's a dire situation um, for him, but they're still going to be good because he's that great. And he can take the punishment, and he's the most hit player in all of football, and yet he still comes up with plays that just blow your mind. Yeah, and and that's what what will win games. He'll he'll do that um, and win a game almost single handedly. I mean, I think I think Hakeem Nix is in a is in a better situation than he was in last season. To be completely blunt about it, I think he will he will hopefully step up to the plate and provide a a, a nice part of their wide receiver tandem there in Indianapolis. But um, I I just think that they they've got still too many weapons on offense for a lot of teams, and they've got. They've got these offensive line problems, but Andrew Luck is going. It just makes takes that away from you. I, I don't necessarily have much hope in their in their running game at times, but Trent Richardson can't be as bad as that. Um, I got one final thing on the Colts to go all football nerdy again, and it's basically a, a signal message to Colts fans, to Chuck Pagano, and to defensive coordinator Greg Minuski. People need to get on his mind and in his head because this guy is maybe the smartest guy to talk about defense on the planet Earth. That's how clever he is. But they run Steven so many sub packages, you know, of different personnel groupings. It shows his hand. I tell you, you watch the games, and I've heard people talk about this all the time. You know, they bang on about it, SI and on the MMQB. You know what play they're running because of the personnel group. It takes like two seconds to figure out because he's got so many layered things, just different concepts and sub packages. And he just shows his hand. He needs to be reined in to the point where let, let's just dumb it down a little bit, Greg, so we can look, you know, maybe the quarterback doesn't know what we're going to run before we run the play. Yeah, I mean, if you're, you're becoming that predictable, it just means, you you know, teams and, and uh, players around the league will learn very, very quickly what you're about to do. And it, unpredictability on, on defense can make up for a hell of a lot of things. And here we get to Houston with Sir Bill O'Brien, the saint that is Bill O'Brien, can do no wrong in the eyes of Penn State faithful. Um, Houston is such a bizarre team. When you go and look at the numbers, then you watch them last year, they quit on their coach. Okay, The, the offense didn't show up. Then look at the numbers. They were 11th in total offense and 7th in total defense. How does that happen? How can they be top 15 in both categories and be one of the worst teams to watch in all of football? I know. It doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, that that, that team had so many problems last year um and yet the, the stats don't um take that into account i mean let's not forget was it the texans started two and oh last year mm -hmm. i remember rightly and then they didn't win a game after that. <laughs> um it was pretty tough for texans fans around uh around the nfl fraternity and you just you just cannot make any sense of it i mean we're, uh, they've got arguably the, the best defensive player in football in JJ Watt, they got the best player in all of football in JJ Watt. Yeah, I mean, and you now put um, Jadevian Clowney with him. <laughs> I'll um, be the second best player in all of football. I just, I just think about this, and I'm if Andrew Luck really does have any sense, I, I would somehow have a migraine <laughs> for both of those games because I, I think that, that not to go back to the culture, but the cultures need to get to the playoffs. They're going to get to the playoffs anyway. So what's the point in having Andrew Luck point. having to get these two games against these this two man wrecking crew that could just cause so many so many problems for you? So if I, I think a lot of quarterbacks are going to have a very very bad day or have a migraine or something, and they're not going to want to play these particular games because I wouldn't want to play against them too. They they've all of a sudden become a very very dangerous defensive tandem and. Could be difficult. I mean, the offense. I mean, they've got they brought Fitzpatrick over um, to be the quarterback. A lot of pressure still on Foster to be the focal point of the offense. And I think this is going to be a team that is not going to be fun to watch if you're going to want to watch a game on Game Pass. I think they're just going to be a, they're going to try and ground out results on a week in week out basis because I just don't think that they're going to be they're going to be anywhere near. 
I am genuinely scared of JJ Watt and Devin Clowney myself just sat here. That they, oh, yeah. They may come, I would be as well. <laughs> they may come through the wall at me at any point in the pair of them because that's how fearsome and scary look. And I love, remember when you go back to the draft and you look at whether the Texans should take Clowney or whatever and people start to break it down. What defense will they run? Can Clowney play outside linebacker? I love that Ray Cornell's like, F that. <laughs> I'm going to line both of them up on the line. I don't care if you want to call him a pass rusher or a stopper. Two of you just destroy the backfield. There's the snap happens, just yeah. obliterate the whole play, and it's going to be devastating to watch. I think they'll be fun to watch just for that factor, just to watch JJ and Jadevian. But outside of that, the team's lacking in real offensive weapons. I love Andre Johnson, but he's getting up there in age. Aaron Foster, I don't buy into it. He was in a major zone system before, and I was in straight up man to man. It's a difficult thing to overcome for a running back who's done one thing for his whole life, so it's a wait and see moment. And they haven't got a quarterback. They've got a quarterback who shouldn't be playing football. Every time his name is mentioned, I'm going to bang this time and time again. He's had like eight or nine concussions now. Yeah, I know. The commissioners to say, I'm sorry, that is too many. I don't want it on my conscience that what's going to happen to you when I meet up with you in later life, what's going to happen with that many? You shouldn't be playing anymore. They're an ideal example, if I'm them, where I say, this will be fun to watch on defense. We'll get everyone hyped. We'll sign JJ to a major extension before the season starts, like he should get paid. And let's just stick Tom Savage in there, the young lad out of pit, pro-style guy himself, major arm, go through the growing pains, and if you finish 2-14 and 14 again, fine, draft James Winston, draft Marcus Mariota. This makes no sense to just stick Ryan Fitzpatrick and throw in the rookie, he might blow your mind, and just have fun with the defense and try and get you know a decent pick, because they're not good anyway if they go 5 and you know whatever, 5 and 11 with Fitzpatrick. It just takes them out of a decent spot to get a good quarterback. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think you're right there. Is put that it, it'll be wise to put the the rookie in now. I think for nothing else as well, because I think this Texans defense will keep t- this team in games. Mm-hmm, I agree. So you you know you you're all of a sudden you're you're not only giving the, the a rookie quarterback a chance to you know learn on the job in terms of you know getting used to the NFL and things like that, but you're also giving yourself a chance to maybe look at what this guy could do in close games. Um, which point. is something that you know is invaluable experience and certainly be you know worthwhile trying. I think going back to your point about concussions, I, I'm beginning to wonder now whether you should have like a set amount of concussions and then that that is it. You know that there is no qualms about this. I mean, I think we we're now um, more in tune with what concussions can do, uh, which we didn't know. 10, 15 years ago and, you know, how it does shorten guys' lives, you know, and the amount of damage it does cause, even if it doesn't manage to get to that point. And I think we we need to take that education on board and start making these right decisions and trying to protect these guys from being out on the field. And you've got that many concussions. It's not going to be good for late on in life. And I think now we need to start installing this maybe. I, I don't know how many I want to say here, but... I think we do need to look at it a lot more closely and actually maybe have a set number. And even if it's not, I'll say, like, okay, five concussions, that's it, you're football done. But say like a certain um, testing procedure after a certain number of concussions, mm-hmm. um, you know, more tests are done, you know, and you really start getting the, the best in the field uh, knowledge and getting them to make a decision whether these guys can physically play or not. Because, you know, a, a player is not going to come and tell you. And we, we all know for a fact that, there are players around this league that have had concussions that we're not aware of. Oh, it happens all the time. They yes. just say, I got dinged coach and stuff, and the coach says, you're okay to go, and they say, yeah. That's the issue. I did the full Make You a Commissioner podcast that the UK Zone lads did for me to make me a commissioner, and I brought this point up exactly, and Robert said it like, you say four, which I think is maybe even one too many to have, you know, mm. from high school to college to the NFL. Four, is a, that's a ton of concussions. The major gap from one to two is just so deadly. If you go and check yeah. out some of the research that they put out there around the NFL draft stuff, um, if you put a thing on it, no one's ever going to say they got a concussion. Imagine you're on two and you're on the fringe of the squad and it's training camp, you got dinged and your head rattled. You're not going to be like, oh, God, yeah, I'm going to yeah. let them know I got a concussion. You're going to do everything to go off it. Then you'll be pleading with coaches. It's it's a tr- very tricky thing to do. The only way to do it is to get shady behind the closed doors and say, owners, don't sign guys with these concussions, yeah. and some, I'll give you this or whatever, and it's not going to matter because if it's Peyton Manning, they're still going to sign him. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, the other thing as well, it's, it, I always say about it, it's a fact, it's not the initial 
part of it when you first get a concussion. That's the issue with the concussions, the Ryan Fitzpatrick thinks, yeah, I want to get a paycheck, I want to, I love football, I want to keep playing. 20 years down the line, if he picks up another one, and it is genuinely, I, people check the numbers, it's like seven or something. Yeah. And as I'm always told, Javon Hay said this to me before, double it. Double a number, maybe take off a couple of its crazy eye, but people get them all the time, and you have to double a number that are player quotes. Yeah, it's quite scary. I mean, we had Javon on the show and, you know, some of the things you get told, I mean, it's, it's very, very scary. And as I say, I worry about the, the post-concussion syndrome as well, which can be, you know, it can be really, really nasty. So it's not even the initial part of the concussion. It's the, it could very well be the uh, the follow-on from it. But going back to the, the Texans as a whole for a minute, I think, yeah, it, it's fun on defence, offence, I think you you're going to not enjoy that too much if you're a Texans fan. Let's get to the AFC South rankings then. I went first last time, so I'll give you the baton. Okay, I have the Titans finishing at 4-12. and 12. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think that the, the, they are the worst team in this division. They've got one of the easiest schedules, and yet they're still one of the worst teams in this division. They're sort of worst team in this division. I've got the Jaguars at 5-13. and 13. That 4-4 four and four finish is not going to vault them. Um, too much to too many more wins this season. I've got the Texans at a surprising eight and eight. Mm-hmm. I really think that the the defensive damage that they can do will keep them in games, and they'll win games that they shouldn't necessarily win. And then I've got Indianapolis winning the division uh, eleven and five. So I think they'll go six and zero against their division, but they'll go just a not a mediocre but a fairly average five and five against everyone else. And that's what will sink them in the playoffs because they can't beat the better teams. All right, then here's mine. I'm going with four and twelve for the Titans. They should be the worst team in the AFC, but there's so many bad teams that they're <laughs> so fortunate right now. Shocking, the Jaguars seven and nine. I'm wow. all in on that defense, and I love me some Gus Bradley. And that's a major turnaround for me because I hold grudges really well, and I don't like the Jaguars, <laughs> so that's a big turnaround for me. And I'm going to shock you some more, Stephen Edwards. The Houston Texans are going to go above 500. Nine and seven. They should start Tom Savage from day one. The boy can ball. That defense is ridiculous. All they need to do is get to 14 points on offense, not turn the ball over. The defense will take care of the rest. And the Colts, same as you, 11 and five. The, I don't think they sweep the division. I think they drop one to Houston. They'll drop a couple of games along the way just because of talent. And Andrew gets one hit too many or can't pull out the bag. But they'll definitely win the division and make the playoffs. Anyone who's listening to this is a Houston Texans fan. I think you should be happy. I mean, we're saying how bad this offense is, <laughs> and yet we're still sitting here predicting. I mean, myself at eight and eight, and yourself at um, nine and seven. So it's it's happier times. And if you can put some offensive players on the field um, over the next year or two, it's going to get very very interesting. Of course, that kind of a record will take you out of that elite quarterback that you maybe want. Trust in Tom Savage, Houston. Start the boy. Just roll with it. Um, AFC East, we move to. It's our division as a Patriots fan, as you, the Dolphins fan. Where better to start than South Beach with your Miami Dolphins? Oh, how I've looked forward to talking about the Miami Dolphins. Um, it, it cannot be as bad as last year. And even if you take a look at the, the off-field stuff, it, it cannot be as bad as that. I'm still surprised that uh, there are certain guys that have got jobs on that team. That, Call them out by that, name, uh, Joe Philbin. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at you, Mr. Philbin. How on earth have you still got a job? Um, all of that went on under your watch, under your nose, and yet you've still got a job. But I didn't, know. Just... I, didn't, I didn't know, Stephen. I had no idea. You didn't know? <laughs> it's more of an indictment, you fool. That was the worst statement I've ever read. Until I read the LMA one on Malky Mackay like 10 minutes ago. That's the worst statement I've ever read in the history of sports. I didn't know. It, well, that's not good. That's not a good thing. Do you, do you know what we actually missed? Do you know what? I actually feel as though we missed a trick last season. What we should have done was actually do it like a like almost like a, a, a trial. And we could have all played the parts of the of the characters. I think we kind of maybe missed a trick oh. then, but I think it might have been a bit of a hard ep- episode for myself to get yeah. through, to be honest. I'd have placed judge, jury, and execution. I would have sent that man down. Um, <laughs> 27th ranked in offense last year. It has to get better than that. There has to be progression from Tannehill. I like what you've done with the offensive line. I love the young rookies. We discussed this after you drafted them. Juwan James is going to be decent. And I actually kind of really like Billy Turner. He projects, you know, I think he's moving to left guard. I think they're going to play him at now. It figures to be some region of Brandon Albert, great signing. Juwan James, Billy Turner, Shelley Smith, and Mike Pouncey is the all-pro center. So you've got two big names who are really good guys at two of the key positions, center, left tackle, young, good 
exciting prospects who can be no worse than Jonathan Martin and Billy Incognito, and then just a solid player in Shelley Smith. Now, am I allowed to say what Dolphins fans haven't been allowing me to say? Can I call out Ryan Tannehill and say maybe it's time for you to step up your game? No, I, I completely agree. I mean, one of the big issues I had with Tannehill last season, I think a lot of people blame the offensive line mm-hmm. uh, for the issues. And, you know, there was issues on the offensive line. And uh, every team that we played just got into our backfield very, very quickly and Tannehill went down. But you begin to watch over a course of a season. And you, when you start looking a lot more closely, you go, Tannehill didn't have to take that sack. He didn't have to take that sack. didn't have to take that sack. And that's the thing. Tannehill, for me, seemed quite happy to take a sack. Mm-hmm. Um, and you become very, very comfortable with that. And it just really, really began to annoy me. And there were times at the beginning part of last season when he played, I thought he was, you know, the first few weeks of the season, I think when we got off to that, he got off to a really reasonable start. He actually looked very, very good. Um, and then over the course of the season, I think, you know, a lot of it may have had to do with some of the, the internal issues going around the team. But he took a step backwards as that season, as that season went on. And I think he doesn't really have any pressure as being the on the number one guy because he is solidified in that spot. Um, and I think that may be one of the issues. I think he's just he's so comfortable in there that he needs somebody else in there to try and elevate him to be able to go up and become that better quarterback that we hope he can be. Because if he doesn't, then Miami have got another mediocre season coming up. Because now, as you rightly say, there we've we've upgraded the offensive line. If now Tannehill starts taking a hell of a lot of sacks again, and we took 58 last season, um, if he starts taking a hell of a lot of sacks again this season, then you've got to start looking at him as a quarterback and thinking, hang on a second, there's a lot more fault against you than there is against um, some of the other parts that are in there. I mean, that's, I think, one of our big key question points this season. I think it is around Ryan Tannehill, and he will make or break wherever this this team goes on on offense um you know we hope that mike wallace and him will get on the page much better than they did last season i think you can pencil in brian hartline for the same kind of season that he always has because he just seems to be mr consistent and he's a guy that tanner hill does love to to go to which is one of the reasons why it irked mike wallace at the start of last season he thought he should be more involved than he is and for me as i, I called him many times last season with yourself he just became a very, very expensive decoy. Yeah, and that's all he was. He, hey, Mike, here's a uh, here's an idea on the wall. Get open. He's never <laughs> open. The guy's always good. For a guy with elite speed, he's not open very often. There's a lot of guys with elite speed playing cornerback in this league right now, and uh, he's very rarely open. Like, remember when he came in and the the word that everyone used was he's gonna blow the top off the defense. Have you seen Mike Wallace blow the top of the defense more than four or five times? No, and I hate that contract. Yeah, but you I, should I, do. I, it's on the worst in football. Well, you know, it may very well be the worst in football. And the other guy I want to call out, and this is like a bit of a, <laughs> almost funny compared to last season, but I mean, and it looks like hopefully the situation is going to be sorted out as well, is the fact that um, Caleb Sturgis is now injured. Oh, no. Um, thankfully, um, we hope that, fingers crossed from my point of view, is that we brought in a guy into camp, um, Potter, who hopefully will be able to solidify that job and keep it because... I was one of the first people to start banging the drum last season about how much I like Caleb Sturgis. <laughs> you got to buy a jersey. <laughs> um, and then I was also one of the first people to turn my back on Caleb Sturgis because what I noticed about him was that when the weather was fine, the guy could kick no problems at all. He could kick very, very straight, very, very far. When you got to a point in the season where the wind, the bad weather, he made zero adjustment <laughs> whatsoever to anything. And he just became a very, very poor poor weather kicker and that's just not going to cut it in the NFL anymore you've got to be Mr. Accurate so I'm kind of hoping that I'm going to try and get Caleb Sturgis out of a job in Miami and uh, he will be replaced because I'm really not happy with that particular kicking situation I wish with all the wishes in my life you had bought that Caleb Sturgis jersey (laughs) So much, so badly. I wish you just because it was like a custom made one. You had to custom make. Yeah, it I, I, I had a custom made jersey. <laughs> it was it was myself and you that were sitting here one night. And we come across this website where you, the, the jerseys, the, the amount you could buy, were just fantastic. And we were just sitting there like talking about what shirts we would like to get. And I was like, I'd you know, really love a Caleb Sturgis Miami <laughs> Dolphin shirt. I think that'd be like a kind of a a cool shirt to own to go alongside my Ryan Tannehill one. 
and thankfully I didn't invest some money, although the Tannehill jersey could be worth it in a year's time, to be honest. Uh, the Tannehill thing is interesting. He gets so many passes from people in the national media, I don't understand what he's done to Garner, other than the fact he's got a very attractive wife. Like, <laughs> he just made Mike Sando, he was second overall on Mike Sando, who I really respect as a writer, he's a good guy, on his breakout list. But he came in the same draft class, and yeah, you don't want to compare, but... Robert Griffin's already made the playoffs. Andrew Luck makes the playoffs. I mean, are we hold him to the highest standard. He came into a team that was in a very similar situation. They brought, you know, everyone with him from Texas A&M that he demanded, the offensive coordinator. Yeah. You know, everyone came with him that he wanted. They drafted a guy for him. I mean, he's been given everything, except for the fact that his offensive linemen didn't like each other. Didn't help. But like you said, he took so many sacks when he could have thrown the ball away. He's athletic. That's what we all heard about. He's athletic. He could have took off. Do you think? I think he's thinking too much. That's why yeah, I, I do. I, th- I, I agree with you. He is overthinking. And I think, you know, maybe it was some of the issues surrounding the, the whole team last season that really didn't help him because, I mean, he, he really did get off to a good start last season. And then the, the wheels came off very, very quickly. And it'll be interesting to see how he gets, gets off to that start this year because I think he does need to not only prove to uh, the Miami Dolphins, I think he does need to prove to himself something as well that, you know, he can be that, that really good quarterback in the NFL. And he, he does need to be. I mean, Miami have had all kinds of problems with starting quarterbacks since the Dan Marino era. By the way, uh, another guy who didn't receive any criticism during the Dolphins scandal, if my life is on the line <laughs> every time I go out there, I'm finding out if my offensive linemen are okay. I'm buying them cookies. I'm the one buying them <laughs> cakes. I'm making all the Starbucks runs. If they want to go to a strip club, I'm footing the bill. My life, I reckon that's what Tom Brady does. You think Tom Brady doesn't know how his offensive linemen are feeling? I, I think Tom Brady knows how every member of that <laughs> offense is feeling, to be completely psychic. honest with you. Psychic, Tom. Um, let's go to the Jets then. 8-8 eight and eight last year. Rex Ryan remains. I'm happy to keep Rex around. Now, the defense is going to be legit. they got one of the best five techniques in all of football in Mohamed Wilkerson. And then, as always, with the with a Rex Ryan New York Jets, what the heck is going to happen with the offense? And I have a rant to do about this, but I'm going to pass the torch to you initially. What are they going to do? We've got Gino, we got Vic, we've got very little weapons. But they ranked 25th last year, so it's not as bad as some people thought. When you look at some big-name teams that we'll get to at some point in these previews that rank behind the Jets, they've been worse with a rookie at quarterback. How do they go about their offense this year? Yes, I mean, I'd, uh, it's a funny situation. Isn't it? You, they bring in Vic to basically be the veteran backup. And now we're looking at a, a scenario where uh, Vic could be the starting quarterback at, at some point this year. Um, I mean, they brought in Eric Decker as well. They brought in Chris Johnson. You know, maybe this will help upgrade their, their offense. But, I mean, for me, it's just there'd be so many question marks on that offensive side of the ball. And, you know, that, their offense last season wasn't that great. I mean, Gino, I think there was a couple of starts where Gino looked very, very good. But in general, at times, he also wasn't. That wasn't that great either. Very, very inconsistent. Um, came into the season last year of um, having beaten out Mark Sanchez and and, and got that job. Uh, I think the thing is with the Jets is the fact that their their front seven will always keep them in games. That's the thing. They're, they're very, very good on the defensive side of the ball. Mm-hmm. I think one of the big question marks I've got about them this season is around their secondary. I think their secondary is... Uh, it could be a real, real concern for them, but hopefully the front seven will make up for a lot of those uh, issues. And I think it, it would... I'm coming round to the idea of starting Vic over Geno Smith. Oh, no doubt about it. I mean, the the defensive backfield, they really need Dean Milliner, who says he's the best cornerback in football, to step up his game and try and act like the best defensive back in football. They've never been able to replace Darrell Rivas because they started to build a scheme they had Darrell Rivas. <laughs> and mm. Those guys don't walk through the door every day, so it's difficult. My rant on the offense is this. <laughs> and I'm looking at the entire NFL when I say this. These NFL front offices don't do anything, anything to help some of these young quarterbacks. It's obscene. Look at what Geno Smith is playing with, right? And I'm not talking about the talent. I'm talking about the scheme. they got Marty Morningwick. He's a West Coast guy. Let's put Geno Smith under center. And whenever you get these spread option quarterbacks coming out of college, what you always hear in the evaluation process, because you've got all these dinosaurs in the league and on TV, can he drop under center? Can he take a five-step drop? Will he play in a pro-style offense? Who cares? Mm. Bring someone from college. Run a spread option offense. Guess what Chip Kelly did last year? He brought a spread option offense to the NFL and it worked. He wrecked the league. He dominated the league in rushing the ball. 
this this, this notion that college offenses won't work in the NFL is just just a dinosaur. Josh McDaniels runs a college offense in New England. They just happen, happen to have a Hall of Famer running the offense, you know? You bring in Geno Smith, who's never been told how to set an alignment, never called his own play. It's one of those offenses where you know huddle and you look over and they're holding up a key card, like at Oregon, to just tell him how to run a play. And then you put him in front of the New York media and you say, um, you, you know, you leak stuff to the press that Geno isn't progressing as well as you should do. He's in a quarterback competition now. We need him to progress to win games. You've given him no shot. You get him a pro-minded offensive coordinator and a pro-minded scheme. Um, these guys aren't, you know, if Gino gets hurt, it doesn't kill the franchise anymore. It's not like if Jamarcus Russell got hurt and, you know, he ate his way out of the league, he was just a bad player. It's not like it kills a franchise anymore. It's a rookie wage scale. You plan for it. It's all built in. You can cut him. They don't, this is the thing that I liked about what the Dolphins did with Tannehill. They brought his offensive coordinator they brought in a load of those spread systems. They worked it in sort of, you know, in tiny little pieces to try and build this new offense that you could play in that was tailor-made to him. It hasn't worked out yet, but at least they tried it. They don't try it. It makes no sense to me. Chip Kelly just ran all over everyone in the NFL running a college scheme, and people are, like, blown away. People have been doing it for years in college. Bring him in. Bring him in. No, it's just, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, dude. Some teams are not willing to um, embrace change. I mean, Chip Kelly brought in a system that you know that, that worked, and it was a breath of fresh air to the uh, to the NFL when you start seeing that systems like that bring, being brought in. But yeah, some teams are in the dark ages. Unfortunately, the Jets are one of those, and again, they're potentially a team that's overrated by their own fan, by their own fan base. Um, I mean, if you want a pro style quarterback, why do these teams keep drafting? Spread option guys. Why did the Redskins yeah. move up to draft RG3 if they want him to learn how to play in the pocket? Makes no sense. Ring up Art Bryles at Baylor, offer him all the money in the world, offer him the five-year $40 million deal you offered Mike Shanahan, and just pray it works. At least give it a shot. At least give it a shot. And it's this is what's annoying, because it's not going to work out playing him in the pocket, so you're going to lose your job anyway. Why don't you lose your job going down firing? To make any yeah, sense and uh, you know the thing is, if you if you don't even try and you then get fired, I mean, it, you're basically um, not even giving yourself a shot at it. At least if you do go down firing, it doesn't work. At least you can say, well, you know, look, I gave it a shot, I did it my way, and you know it just didn't work out. It didn't work out, and it may be a case of you know another team will take a look and go, well, maybe in a different situation, maybe that'll work on my team. And you'll get another shot at. it. Anyway, to my football team, to Boston MA, we go. 12 and 4 in 2013. Stephen, they've got better. Significantly better. Gronk's back. They've upgraded some parts of the receiving core. Those young guys have just got better. Brady's always great. They were 26th in defense last year. They just went out and stole one of the best cornerbacks to ever play this game. And all the rookie young talent is improving and improving. They pick up Brandon Browner as well. I'm excited, man. I'm excited about this team. Uh, one fact for you 10 years since you won a Super Bowl. And we could do, we want to roll that out for every team in the NFL. No, but exactly. Just, what are you on about? Just... I hate that argument. People say that to me all the time. And who cares? Doesn't mean I can't oh, be excited. Look at that. Look, it, just say you just you push that button, and all of a sudden it, it sets him off. It's, it's like a dog barking. It doesn't set me off. I'm not bothered by it. It's, it's amusing that people think that's like a negative thing. Uh, Brady, you know, Brady hasn't won in seven years, and he went three before that. Who gives a shit? <laughs> Joking aside, because that's that's what that is. I mean, it, anyone who listened to the podcast last last year will know that uh, through gritted teeth, I, I gave New England a hell of a lot of credit because I mean, the the guys that they put around Brady at times <laughs> last year were not the caliber of players that they've had in recent times. But I always say this about Brady: is that Brady just makes other people around him just that much better. He turns these guys into much better players. He could take a, an average guy and turn him into a good player. He could take a good player and turn him into a great player. It's what Brady does. He just everyone just gets that much confidence. They know where Brady's gonna put the football. They know they can rely on him one hundred percent. I mean for me, I mean that, that was probably Belichick's maybe best ever coaching job he's ever done with that particular group last year with some of the things that they had to overcome. I mean Gronkowski was out injured, they had other injuries that other parts of the season as well, and I suppose that's maybe the only question mark coming into this season is around whether or not they're going to have the same kind of injury problems that they had last season. But I mean, I've got a guy like I mean, Darrell Revis. I mean, that's just a, such a major 
game-changing upgrade for you. I mean, it's just just incredible when you're able to put a guy like that out on the field. And I, I do really like the the Patriots' defense this year, and it's certainly been a a major upgrade. You're not going to finish in the twenties in defense this year. You're going to be a far better team than that. I, for me, I don't think it's going to translate into regular season wins for no, you. It won't do. And, and the reason why I say that is because I think the division is so poor that I don't, you're another case like the Colts. I think at times you could kind of like breeze through games. I think it's more important from the Patriots point of view. Is it the fact they're healthy in the playoffs? Mm-hmm. Then they don't need to go out 100% through the regular season. So, Anyone who's going to sit there and go, oh, hang on a second, the Patriots are 12 and 4 last year. They're so much better this year. Maybe they'll, they'll win more games than that. I don't think they will. And I don't think they have to. I think they just, and then home field doesn't necessarily mean that much, even to, even to the Patriots from that point of view either. It's, I just think they just need to be 100% healthy going into the playoffs. Because I think if they're that, then they become a very, very dangerous proposition. Yeah, I completely agree with you. It won't translate, and it doesn't need to. I would genuinely put Gronk on the pup list. We don't need him for seven mm. weeks. We didn't need him for yeah. seven weeks last year. Just rest him, make sure he's 100%. Because they could have had, and I know people say, what are you talking about? Gronk didn't play in the two Super Bowls they played in, and he is the most dynamic offensive threat in the league. You know, with arguably, especially at that time, the best quarterback in the league. It's definitely in the top three right now. By the way, I love the thing that um, he's not playing with some of the names he once played with because I don't know what names he's played before outside of Randy and, and Gronk. I'm reading this list here. This is a great list. People should go and find it. It's on the Pat's pulpit, which is like my bookmark. Let's go and read about the Pat's stuff. These are guys who've caught double-digit touchdown passes from Tom Brady, okay? And there's only 12 of them. Dion Branch, Troy Brown, Kevin Fulton, Christian Fuara, David Givens, Daniel Graham, Rob Gronkowski, Aaron Hernandez, Randy Moss, David Patton, Ben Watson, and Wes Welker. And you can just hear the collective, like, what? Of, like, the people who got into the NFL in, like, 2012? Because (laughs) who are those people? No, you know, is... it's unbelievable. They finished seventh in total offense last year with little Danny Amendola and little Julian Edelman and Legarrette Blunt running the ball. Seventh. Do you know what Pat Brady did for some of those guys you read out there? Mm. He made them into stars. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing. They, these guys weren't weren't stars before they were paired with Brady. But mm-hmm. by the time Brady had finished with them, they were guys that people around the league knew. And it's you know, <laughs> so when you look at it now and you sit there and say, well, you know. It, didn't have as much talent around him. It's probably not. It's probably not as fair in some respects. It's more the fact that they weren't as maybe as well known as some of the guys that we look back on and think, you know, these guys were just like tremendous talent. But by the end of the season, we knew all about these Patriots wide receivers. And again, a hell of a lot of that has got to go towards Tom Brady and the, the offensive scheme that's been put in place. Nothing against the receivers, but they they had their game to elevated. And if you are able to go in there, you're willing to work hard and you're willing to be able to do that then I think you're going to benefit a hell of a lot within a Patriots system. Because if you play well, I think that's one system where you're going to get your opportunity. No doubt about it. Last couple of thoughts from me on the New England Patriots. Number one, Josh McDaniels doesn't get the credit he should get for being an offensive genius. And yes, I use that mm. word offensive genius. He brought in many things into the league. Go and listen to the Ross Tucker football podcast. Embarrassing with Tim at Denver and all that stuff. But guy's an offensive genius. And the new New England secondary. Think about how poor it's been recently. and It's always been rookies. Now we've got Revis Browner, Logan Ryan, who's going to be a star. Dewan Harmon, who's going to be a star, and Devin McCordsy. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's I <just> loaded. <laughs> it, it's an upgraded defense. That's what I said to you. You're not going to finish as low as you did last year. And you put that against with that offense. And as I say, I mean, it, it, it won't translate to any more wins in the regular season, but it's going to be very, very dangerous in the in the playoffs. Let's get to the Buffalo Bills then, because this should take two seconds. They've got a head coach i got no faith in. He should still be in college. And they've been Jim Schwartz. This went under the radar. Jim Schwartz is the new defensive coordinator of the Buffalo Bills. I mean, it's game over. Why did they trade up in the draft when they got Schwartz? It's just <laughs> it's one of those things, isn't it? I mean, I, do you know what? The, the 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 funnest part of this season for Buffalo is going to be Sammy Watkins. Oh, he's never going to get the ball. Who's going to get the ball to Sammy Watkins? EJ well, Manuel? I, I, well, when he does get the ball, I think it's going to be the most fun part of the season. I don't necessarily think he's going to, you know, he's going to set the world alight because I don't think he's had the ball that much. But that for me is going to be um, the highlight. I mean, uh, Alonso is out for the season. Um, I mean, EJ Manuel couldn't stay healthy last year. Can he play a whole season this year and see whether or not he's 
he's actually a guy that can be um, a, a quarterback in this league. I, the fact is, as bad as Buffalo are going to be, they'll still find a way to beat beat Miami. That's what he did last <laughs> season. Um, I think I said it to you off air once. I don't know if I said it on air before, but um, I genuinely believe, and I spoke to a couple of people who feel similar now, EJ Manuel isn't always hurt. Like, they're not bad injuries. They're injuries that other quarterbacks would and yeah. can play through. And I think it's something he needs to learn that, look, young fella, <laughs> this isn't Florida State. <laughs> Everything isn't handed on a, on a card to you. You're not playing with five-star recruit offensive linemen. Someone's going to hit you. Your finger's going to hurt. Go out there and throw the ball. Do you know what? I, I, I jokingly said about it is having this trial episode. Um, I, do you know what? I think a fun segment that sometimes in the future... I sit down with EJ Manuel. <laughs> no, no, not even that. I think an even better segment would be the fact that at some point, I'm going to get you to play the part of a particular person in the NFL, and you're going to be that person. <laughs> I can do that. Because I think it would just be absolutely hilarious. It just made me laugh when you just going about the... Yeah, the pep talk to EJ Manuel about his injury issues. <laughs> I love taking on the role of a coach. It's because this is what <laughs> I want to do. So I love taking on that role. Um, Sammy Watkins is going to be a superstar. I have no issue with them giving up a first-round draft pick next year, even if it ends up being a top three overall pick and they miss out on Jameis, who's going to play baseball. I wonder who's going to take the gamble on drafting him in the top five and he's going to play baseball. That, that, that's a quandary for me. Um, or you miss out on Marcus Mariota. He's, to me, the second coming of Randy Moss. Do you see him do that double move in that YouTube video? I haven't seen a rookie do that in a long time. He's going to be spectacular. So he's exciting for Buffalo fans. So the Buffalo fans this year, Stephen, just to just to recap this for them so they can get in their heads. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, Donald Trump's going to buy your team. He's going to move it to Brooklyn. He's going to move it like, you know, a state. Doug Marone's going to be out as head coach. You're going to get Jim Schwartz. He'll probably get promoted upwards because that's what Jim Schwartz does. And you're going to beg to see Sammy Watkins catch the ball and he's got no one to throw the ball to. Throw yeah, to it's, it's, to. it's going to be a, a fun season. Maybe we should get uh, Carl Pfeiffer, who came on the show last year to, towards the start of the season, as, uh, talking about the Bills. Maybe we should get him back on after the Bills get off to a slow start. Yeah, I feel bad for that. That's another defense I feel bad for. They'll be on the field constantly and they're so loaded with talent. It's just... <laughs> It's brutally unfair. Um, let's do AFC standings. Okay, so in the AFC East, um, I'll go first this one, and then I'll let you go first on the on the last division. Mm-hmm. But I've got Buffalo at five and eleven mm-hmm. um, for every single reason we've already talked about. I've got Miami at seven and nine. Another very poor season for us. It's not going to be fun. I've got the Jets still at uh, eight and eight. Too many question marks. And then I've got the Patriots at. 12 and 4, same as last year. Yeah, they could win more games if they wanted to, but they're not going to want to win those games. They're just going to want to stay healthy. Yeah, I think that they're all in with the playoffs, and that's where we'll see a difference, hopefully. Hopefully, fingers crossed. I got the Bills at 4 and 12 for everything we've already articulated. Dolphins at 6 and 10. I'm a little bit more down because you know my feelings about Joe Philbin. I couldn't give him that extra game that he would deserve. A coach will win on his own two games, I think, a year, and Philbin isn't getting either of them. The Jets at 9 and 7 because Rex will win you a game. At least one on his own, and I got the Patriots at thirteen and three because the division stinks so much. They're going to sweep through it. They're going to gain a load, a load of momentum, and I think only the Broncos can stop them in a in a one on one game. So thirteen and three for my Patriots. This is one of the first times they're going with like crazy confidence in the Pats. Yeah, this is it. And you know, for myself as a Dolphins fan, you know, I, I think I'm quite impartial when it comes to the Patriots. I'm not. I don't tend to shoot them down as much as I would like to. And you know, I've got a healthy respect for the. The New England Patriots organization, and you know, I, I can't look down on them because I just think they are, you know, a very good football team, and it's going to be two very, very tough games for Miami this season against them. I don't think Miami will beat the Patriots this season. Okay, let's go to the final division in the AFC to wrap up this preview. Let's look at Denver, and I cannot understand how this organization has gone from that final year of Tim trading into the Jets to where they're at now. It's sensational. They have the number one offense of all time behind Peyton. This is their coaching staff. Remember we spoke about just getting good coaches in? you got John Fox, who's an elite defensive coach, has been to the Super Bowl on his own. You have an offensive coordinator that doesn't matter because Peyton Manning runs the offense and he's one of the best offensive coordinators and he's still playing to ever play this game. And Jack Del Rio, who was a good head coach in Jacksonville, Jacksonville wish they had him back now, and could be a head coach wherever he wanted to be, but turned down the interviews because he says, I want to win a Super Bowl ring. And he wants to go and win one with Denver right now. So they, a team, again, just flooded with good coaching. And then you added DeMarcus Ware. You added Aqib Tlaib. You steal TJ Ward from Cleveland. He's a really good safety. Think about how bad they've been in, in the secondary. You remember the burn play with Joe Flacco over Raheem Moore? Won't happen anymore. 
and they lose Eric Decker, but it's fine because we'll rob Emmanuel Sanders, who's a really good receiver out of SMU and was at Pittsburgh. We'll bring him in instead for Peyton. I, I don't know how they get better every year. It's it's unfair. Yeah, they, they they do get better every year, and you know Demarcus Ware as well, and they've got they've got such a talented group of players around Peyton Manning, and if they do end up losing a player, they just seems they upgrade it anyway. And it, that just becomes very, very difficult to watch. But you know, they're, they're a very talented offense that were made to look very, very average in the Super Bowl when they got off to a very, very slow start and they never really recovered from that. Um, your coaching uh, team, I think it, you're completely spot on with what, everything you say there. I mean, I, I would love to be the offensive coordinator for that team because <laughs> you just sit there and just like look occasionally above your clipboard <laughs> now and again. Adam like, Gase interviewed for jobs as an NFL head coach like you know this coming year and turn them down are you kidding me he's got the best job on the planet he's like why would I leave this for the yeah. pressure pit when I'm coaching Peyton Manning and everyone's interviewing me and wants me as like this genius Peyton's running this show he <laughs> audibles every play he did it in the first play of the Super Bowl he never calls a play is that, it's yeah, this is, that's, that's exactly what Peyton God does. So, yeah. He could actually send out any particular player. Yeah, I would do it. Go, I, uh, no. I'd send out a really bizarre personnel package and set and just watch Peyton try and move it around and then he'd probably get like a ridiculous like fake screen touchdown because he's Peyton bloody Manning. In the regular season, of course, Stephen. Let's not kid ourselves. It's yeah, it's just, <laughs> a regular season quarterback or Hawaii Manning as I, as I dubbed him previously. Maybe they should um, let Adam call some more plays in the playoffs. Yeah, I think they're going to have to because um, Peyton has obviously shown he can't actually do it. But uh, joking aside, I mean, this is such a talented team in football. It's, I mean, it's just it's just ridiculous just how much talent they have on both sides of the ball. I mean, you know, look at a guy like Von Miller. I mean, Von Miller is mm-hmm. an absolute stud. I mean, just, and wasn't it, taking drugs great. this year apparently, so he's allowed to play for oh, some, most of the year. Oh, there you go. I mean, you know, clean <laughs> Von Miller. <laughs> clean Von Miller, maybe not. We don't know. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying that in all seriousness as well. Um, what I like about them is defensively they lost bigger names, so you lost like a Champ Bailey and a Dominic Rogers Cromarty, but they got better because they just went out and signed good players to replace them. I really love Bradley Roby out of Ohio State. Massive character concerns, but the guy's going to be... He just won't see the field at all if he doesn't book his ideas up. He's going to want to play, so that's as good as an incentive to change character as any, I feel. Yeah, I mean... It's it, it's just a, it's it, for me. I mean, I, I you know this this whole Denver situation is just I'm I'm just sitting there looking at it and just just stars everywhere. Before people start raving about Peyton having an even better year than last year, let's just I'm going to no. leave you with this one tidbit. Last year they faced the NFC East. That's the Redskins defense. It's the Giants defense. That's the Cowboys historically bad defense. This year they faced the NFC West, Seattle. Yeah. St. Louis, <laughs> you know, 49ers, the Cardinals, that might be four of the five best defenses in football. So let's just cool ourselves on that a little bit because it, it might be rough for Peyton. I think they're going to be great, but it's just he's going up against that division. There's going to, it's good for them that they can check themselves before they get to the big stage. Yeah, I think that, that's exactly it. Yeah. They're going to have so many gut check games during the regular season that, you know, I'll give them a chance to see exactly where they are against some of the, the, the better teams in football. Whereas last season, they just kind of steamrolled over certain teams. And then when they, they did come over against a really, really, really good NFC team, they just they were just completely overmatched. I think it's, it's going to be interesting. I mean, as I say, we, we can't talk enough about you know, the, the stars they have and you know, the, the guys that could step up in you know, so many different scenarios for them. I mean, if one particular player hurts you one week, another guy could hurt you the next week. It's it's just the way it is. They've just got so much talent, and you know, Payton Manning will have games where he just looks completely unstoppable. Mm-hmm. But when he goes against some of these defenses, I think it'll be very interesting to see how he how he does do. And you know, I I don't think he'll have a a year like he had last year, but I think he'll like probably like yourself. I think he still have like a a very very good year. And again, they just need to obviously keep him healthy come the playoffs and of course the writers cast their ballot yesterday i believe for mvp votes so he, he won oh, that okay. um, <laughs> to san diego then we go and this team has revitalized last year fifth ranked offense after stinking up with norv revitalized philip rivers under mike mccoy a former peyton manning offensive coordinator by the way so maybe they do know something 
Um, I like this team. They got better defensively once uh, Ingram came back. That was bizarre how when Melvin Ingram came back, they went from being like one of the worst defenses to the last seven weeks being unbelievably good defensively. So I, I like this team. I, do you know what? I'm not so high on this team. I just think, um, I think there's so much pressure on Rivers' shoulders. I think he's he's the thing that makes this team go. Do you not think uh, that he's got that personality that he thrives in it? Because you look at how they used to be. This is the first year because North's such a control freak that he was allowed to, like I say, unleash these players, these guys who've been here for years, let them audible, to not let a player audible in the NFL is daft, and just take some command of the offense, run some no huddle. He seemed to thrive in it. I think he I think he likes everything being on him. I think he's that sort of personality. Yeah, I just yeah, it, it just I, I'm not saying he's a you know, he's not a bad quarterback or anything like that, but I just think, you know, there's so much pressure on his shoulders and, and he's a, he will take this team as far as they, they can actually go. And I think I'm just waiting for certain things to happen. Um and then they won't be as good. Obviously, I mean, Ken Wisden Hunt has also gone as well. If mm-hmm. we talk about his benefits onto the, the the new team that we have, I think to be pretty much, to be completely honest with you, I, I thought this team actually slept through free agency. <laughs> no, it's just, it's just like he hey, just they had, and went for them. They had a Kellen Clemens. Let's calm down now. Kellen Clemens is there as the backup <laughs> quarterback. I do like the addition of Brandon Flowers. I know it was late, but you steal him from a divisional rival, and I still really think he can ball. He was like 11th in pro football focuses cornerbacks. Stunned that the Chiefs let him go. Really odd decision. Must have been to do a salary cap, but I don't get involved with that. At least that's a dozen. Um, I like that one, but like you said, they did nothing else. What else did they no, do? They just, they just, they just, like, they just, it just didn't happen. It was bizarre. Just, they didn't just, lose you know, anyone, though, either. Thought this team, when you finish the season, was just like, okay, well, uh, when does the next season start? Yeah, they lost no one. They they only <laughs> lost Derek Cox. They brought in Brandon Flowers. They played the same position, so it's basically one and the same. The... The one thing I'll give people to look out for is this Jeremy Chu out of Georgia Tech, the rookie. He probably won't play much, but when you talk about physical freak, remember how high I was on Khalil Mack? This is like a carbon copy. He just didn't play all the time. He's going to come up with some, you know, red zone's going to come on, and the guy who swats the ball, grabs the ball, hurdles someone and takes it to the house, that might be Jeremy Chu. He's special. Yeah. I mean, there is is some special talent. I mean, you know, uh, obviously, like raving high on him from speaking to you around about the, the the draft time, and when you can try and get guys like that, and they can really they they don't necessarily help you straight away, but you know they're a guy that can you can slowly bring along and 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 get integrated into your system. That's always you know it's always a good thing uh, to have. But I I I'm just not that high on this Chargers team. I can just I can just see this team being you know Rivers will win them a, a game one week. And then he'll still look good the next week, but he'll be a, he won't be able to win that game by by himself at times. And I just think maybe they're just gonna they're gonna fall foul in what is a very very tough division outside of the Oakland Raiders. To Oakland, then the gift that keeps on giving. You talk about bizarre franchises with zero direction. I think their GM might be on the hot seat because when you look at a guy who was in this plan of I've got no cap room, I'm backloaded in cap i can sign like vet min guys because we've loaded the cap with guys who aren't on the team my owner who sadly passed away spent all my draft picks and so i'm waiting here to happen they get to a point where they can start drafting again and for some reason he says oh my god i'm on the hot seat let's go and sign every veteran who was good in 2011 do you know what i i felt when i over the off season that this was just a home for guys that needed a change of scenery Every single guy that needed a get out and wanted to go and play somewhere else, and I can just imagine him just sitting there going, "Okay, to the agent, I want to go and play somewhere else." Okay, yeah, that's fine. We've got your place to go and play, and then they don't deliberately tell them where they're going to play. <laughs> hey, I'd like to live in Oakland, California. Don't sleep on that. That's probably why they didn't play well. They were living in Oakland, California. Um, they just signed everyone decent from 2011. Half of them are over the hill. MJD's done. Justin Tuck's done. I mean, <sighs> James Jones to me is done as well. They, there's a reason why a lot of these franchises that are good franchises cut these guys yeah, because they're over it, the hill. And a lot of these guys have contributed massively for these teams. Do you think Jacksonville let Maurice Jones-Drew walk out the door lightly? He's like the great player in their history. If they're letting him go, he's done. Yeah, he is done. And he had a really poor season last year as, as the Jaguars running back. So they brought him over, they got uh, Matt Sharp uh, coming over as quarterback. I mean, 
I say it's it's like almost like a, a place where players go to die. Mm. They're like their final little door they go through before they exit the NFL. They've all and got to go sad. through Oakland. That's got to be part of their contract whilst they play in the NFL. It's sad because guys who really studied the draft and watch college football like me, it was a great little team last year because it was all those like fourth round picks that you told your friends about before the draft. Yeah. Like, or like when undrafted, you're like, this guy's going to be good. Trust me, trust me. And they never do pan out, but you, you want to believe in them because you loved them at Florida or something. They all made their way to Oakland and they were there again this year. My guy, Khalil Matt, goes there. Interested to see what Derek Carr can do because I don't think he can play but people love him it was becoming this nice nucleus of young guys who it's like I can literally see them translate from one year to college and go straight to the NFL and now they blew it up by signing all these veteran guys yeah so they, you're either doing one thing or the other you're either going down the youth movement and mm-hmm. you stay away from these guys or you sign these guys and because you don't know quite what you're doing and I think it more reeks the fact they don't know what they're doing I mean Khalil Mack is a is a can't miss prospect mm-hmm. well he is. It's the Oakland Raiders, but <laughs> if they just let him go and play, then you know I'm very excited to watch him. They also have the uh, Gary Kubiak factor that they may quit on their head coach. He's on the hot seat, and by week four we know he's going, but they won't fire him, and so then they just quit. That's in there. Yeah, and this this team will quit in a hurry. They're going to be a, again become a team that no, they're not. People are not going to like to watch. I mean. I've got a ticket for the game over here against the Dolphins, and I just know it's going to be a very, very poor game. I just hope the Dolphins don't lose to the Raiders mm-hmm. in Wembley, because I will probably <laughs> cry as I leave Wembley. Let's go to the Kansas City Chiefs to wrap this whole thing up. Then I promise people are almost there. We're going to wrap this up <laughs> with the Kansas City Chiefs and talk about a team that slept through free agency. Half their players left. Yeah, their, their, offens- really their offensive line walked out the door. Brandon Albert, John Asamoa, Jeff Schwartz all left. Akeem Jordan, a big piece, was inside linebacker left. Kendrick Lewis and Quentin Demps, the two safeties, walked out the door. Dexter McCluster left. Is is anyone left? By the way, they signed no one. They signed Jeff Limbach, so uh, that's all good. Signed a guard. They signed no one. No, and the thing is as well is the fact that they have a very, very tough schedule. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not going to be as good as they were last year. For me, they're going to be the team that takes probably the biggest step back I'd agree. from last season because, I mean, last season, I mean, they, they, they piled up the wins and, you know, and really, you know, they they were a team that I think people got a bit carried away with mm-hmm. um, more than anyone else. And I think this team, this time they're going to come a bit crashing back down to earth. Um They've got to get more from Bo as well. Bo's got to give them much, much more. Than he he got paid, him. and then he got caught smoking pot. Is there a correlation between the two Stephen Edwards? He obviously had a bit of money to, <laughs> to, to burn, dare I say. <laughs> That's a good pun. Uh, <laughs> and then he just dropped off in all production and just fell into yeah. some massive crater. And those guys don't often come back when they're so hell-bent on getting paid, and they get paid, they don't always bounce back because for some reason... I get this feeling they don't enjoy football or don't love football. And Jamal Charles has only just gone into camp and he's their only offensive weapon, unless you love DeAnthony Thomas. Remember when he was going like the first overall because he's the fastest man alive? Mm-hmm. DeAnthony Thomas, the guy just isn't big enough for the NFL. And I really like him, but there's a reason he dropped to like the fourth or fifth round. He just isn't big enough. Look at what happened to Tavon Austin at St. Louis last year. People got carried away. He went like eighth overall to St. Louis. Just not big enough. Some people just aren't big enough to play. It's unfortunate, but it's true. No, this is it. I mean, you, you you look around. It's a different league now than it was ten, fifteen years ago. Guys like that ten, fifteen years ago would have been probably absolutely fine. But in this in this particular day and age, it just doesn't work. And you you've got to be bigger than that. And the, if they're not, then you're going to get lost. And this is my favourite landing spot to discuss my new draft theory about taking offensive tackles. You can find offensive tackles, guards, defensive tackles, interior alignment anywhere walking the earth. I genuinely believe that. You can go into free agency like the Patriots have done with Logan Mankins and stuff and find these guys and if they fit your system and your quarterback trusts them and you have a Hall of Fame quarterback, it works out pretty well. All these teams at the top of the draft should be just shooting for the stars on guys who play in skill positions. I'm including cornerbacks, safeties, uh, wide receivers, running backs, and quarterbacks. Shoot for the stars. Stop drafting Luke Jokel with the second pit and just take a punt on Geno Smith and hope it works out. I mean, with a rookie wage scale, and you can get these guys walking off the door, plus the fact one of the best left tackles in football, Valdir, no one even spoke about it, but he just left the Raiders and moved teams. So you can get out guys who are all pros in free agency at left tackle. You know, you guys took a chance on Jake Long, and he's a great player. Then he walked out the door to St. Louis, and did he affect your football club whilst he was there? 
really? Did he change much for you? But you could have maybe moved the, the pole if you just shot the moon for a quarterback and you hit. These teams got to start taking just major risks in this day and age where you your lifespan is two years as a coach and general manager. Shoot for the quarterback. Yeah, no, I can. It, it, you know, sometimes you do, if you're going to take that offensive lineman, you do get an all pro uh, once in a generation offensive lineman. I mean, we're, does it move the needle there? <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, is it worth taking that over a guy that can change your, your offense and, and keep you in the job? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I suppose obviously the most recent one I can certainly think about was obviously speaking to Richmond Webb. I mean, he was a kind of like a once in a generation mm-hmm. um, offensive lineman. Um, you know, it, it's it's wrong to think that he isn't in the Hall of Fame, and hopefully one day he will be. But is is that guy going to come around in every single draft? No. Is that guy even if he does come around in that draft? Is that guy going to stay with the same team? Mm, possibly not. So you you are you are what you say you're a lot better off taking the the skill position and then hope that 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 particular player adds that many wins to your team because will an will an offensive lineman add that many wins to your team even if they play at an all pro level? Exactly. No. This is the theory. I'm glad you back up. Look at Eric Fisher. He went with the number one overall pick last year. He looks lost on the field. He may be the worst player in the world right now. That's how bad he looks. He looks confused. He looks like he's playing with the burden of being the number one overall pick. And even if he walked it as an all-pro, would you be buying the Chiefs more this year when they got no one to throw the ball to? Just because he's a pro bowler. Imagine if they just said, and I just said Tavon Austin isn't big enough, but everyone got really excited. He could have changed your offense completely. Take a stab. Take a stab at Tavon Austin. Maybe, maybe it revolutionizes it. I think these guys have just got. It's the same thing with the bringing some of the college guys in, to different thinkers, bringing in a scheme that fits the quarterback you drafted, even in the second round. Just bring a guy in to work with him. These guys have got to take more risks. They're losing their jobs every year anyway. Start taking some risks. Yeah, you're going to have to. I mean, we talked about this even in other sports. You know, you, you don't get long in those jobs sometimes. Um, you know, it's all very well drafting these guys and, you know, stacking these assets and it'll be a you know, benefit down the line, but. Who knows who that's going to benefit? It may not benefit yourself. It might benefit somebody else. So take the chance. And if it doesn't work out, then fair enough. At least you've given it a go. But I think a lot of guys are very, very conservative. All right, then we're going to wrap this up with the AFC West standings. I'll go first, as you said earlier, Stephen. I got the Raiders at 3-13. and I think they struggle early on. They quit on the coach, and it's just a long, hard season. But, hey, they're going to draft Jameis, and they'll go and play baseball, so that'll be fun for them. The Chiefs at 7-9, and big regression. I just don't want to bet against when you have a talented team with a good coaching staff. I just don't want to drop them too much further down. The Chargers, 9-7 and again. I spoke about that team. I like that team. I like Philip Rivers. And the Broncos have got 14-2. and two. I'm going back against everything I said against the NFC West. I just got this feeling Peyton will light them up a couple of times. They'll get him twice, but he'll get the other of them twice. And I can't see anyone stopping him. So I got 14-2. and two. Yeah, if you, if you put them up 14-2, and two, obviously you've just gifted them the, uh, the, the number one seed over in the, in the AFC. Okay. Um, I've got the, the Oakland Raiders at 3-13 and 13 as well. I think you know they, they're very, very poor. Um, I've got the Chargers and the Chiefs both at seven and nine. Um, I, I, as I said, I think Kansas City are, are going to make a big regression. Mm-hmm. I'm not such a big fan of um, San Diego, so we'll see how they pan out. And I've got Denver, kind of the same situation as New England, at twelve and four. I don't necessarily think they'll go health or lever like they did last season and just want to try and win as many games as possible. I think they'll be quite comfortable on twelve and four. Come on now, you don't think Peyton Manning's going to pad his stats? No. Come on, Peyton Manning pads his stats better than he's, anyone has. He's all, he's the first ballot Hall of Famer all time for padding stats. He's got to learn. I'm hoping he's got he's to learn. He's 39. <laughs> I know. I, I'm hoping he's earned a lesson from last season because by the end of you know, by the time we got to the Super Bowl last year, that's true. It was you know, it, it was pretty bad. I think they've got to look at things a little bit different this year. Yes, they are very very talented, mm-hmm. but. They've got to be. They've got to play a different game this season. What they played last season. So now it's time to crown our AFC champion, and it'll be interesting to see exactly oh, who you're going to crown as your AFC champion. Wow, this is a this is a curveball. I've completely forgot at this point in the game, an hour and a half in, that we were doing this part. I genuinely think that you know the Colts are a good team, but they're going to get knocked off by the Pats or the Broncos. The Pats and Broncos. I do believe. I I want to make this bold prediction that someone from the AFC North. 
Someone not named Denver and New England will represent the AFC, but I just can't do it because it's just too easy to pick the other guys. He looks silly when we get here, you know, in February, and it isn't one of the. And I didn't pick one of these two, so I will say it's Denver versus New England, and there's no chance in hell in a championship game I'm picking against Tom Brady against Peyton Manning. I know, don't tell me about last year. I'm talking about me personally as a Pats fan. I ain't doing that to Tom. I'm 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 gonna take the Pats. See, I. I'm not sure if I said to you off air actually, or I've mentioned this to a couple of people, and I think if anyone's been following my Twitter account, they'll, they'll, I'm sure I tweeted out what my early Super Bowl prediction was, and anyone who didn't see it, I'm not going to spoil from the NFC side of things when we do the NFC preview, um, in a in a few days' time. But my AFC Championship winner is the New England Patriots. Yes. I, I, you already know that anyway, so I'm sure you remember <laughs> me saying it too. Um, but I, I just think that New England this year, I mean, the defense has been upgraded. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't want to bet against that offense. I just can't see Peyton winning another one in Denver, and I just think it's going to end in a in a bit of a, a bit of a sad tale. So as much as it pains me to say, I have got the the Patriots going to the um, uh, to the Super Bowl this year. Well, I thank you for that, sir. And Darrell makes all the difference. Thank God. Team Darrell. I'm all in with Darrell Revis <laughs> this year. I so badly want to pick the Steelers. For some reason, there's something in me that says just pick the Steelers. They'll get figure it out. But the Patriots are loaded. They're loaded where they need to be finally to make a playoff run. And we both picked them, which is a bad omen, but I'm still excited. I, I think you've got every right to be excited this season. I think if they if they take the approach of that they need to be healthy just come playoff time, which I think they will do. I mean, I wouldn't bet against Belichick not making the, the right decision. Um, I, I just think that that will, you know, put them in a very good position to win the the, the AFC this season. And it's, it's it's you know it's difficult to bet against Peyton because obviously he's got so many talented players around him. And I think that will make one hell of an AFC Championship game, okay. New England against Denver. I think that will just be the, the Championship game that we all want to see. It would be nice maybe if one of the other teams from uh, one of the other divisions did throw a little bit of a curveball in there, but I really, at the moment, can't make the case. Steelers are potentially the only one, but I really would not want to put one of those teams in the in the AFC Championship game. And if you do that, you're just gambling on three guys, Tomlin, Big Ben, and Dick LeBeau. Yeah. It's like there's no other rhyme or reason to do it, but I just don't want to gamble on those three guys because it may come up trumps. All right, buddy, we'll leave it there for a comprehensive AFC preview. What more do people need? Exactly. This is the um, the, the first part of it. We've got uh, the NFC preview coming up, and that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking, at, you know, I'm looking forward to talking about that. I said to you tonight, I'm looking forward to talking some football because football season is almost here. Damn right, and I'll talk to you with some NFC football next time. Until then, it's a good night from me. 